Good evening. Well, good evening, and thank you all for coming on what is obviously a very wet and stormy night, and if it weren't for daylight savings time, I'd have a much better bad beginning. Um, dark and stormy. Um, <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Um, if we haven't met, my name is Frank Bowles. I'm the director of the Clark Historical Library. The Clark sponsors a series of presentations every semester on campus. Um, tonight, we are delighted to sponsor a presentation by Dr. Hope May. Um, Hope is a professor in CMU's philosophy and religion department. She's also director of, they just changed the name, the Center for International Ethics. I got the right name. Hope is smiling at me. I did it right. Um, her presentation tonight will be, is entitled Peace, Patriotism, and Public Education, May Wright Sewell and ECW, E.C. Warner. I always want to say ECW. E.C. Warner, um, which I think will be a topic you'll find quite interesting. And with that brief introduction, Hope. So thank you, uh, Frank, and <clears throat> the rest of the Clark Historical Library. Um, the, there's a great team that works at the Clark Historical Library, and I also want to acknowledge Brian Whitledge for helping me with some of the materials that you will be seeing in the presentation. Uh, so first, everybody should have three different things. Uh, they're on the table if you're near the table and don't have them, and if not, then Randy in the front can bring them to you. And one is a sort of outline of the talk. Uh, it's a white piece of paper. One is this little card on the peace flag. And the third is a pen. We're celebrating. This is the inaugural event of the, as Frank said, newly named uh, Center for International Ethics. Uh, it used to be called the Center for Professional and Personal Ethics but we've been doing a lot of things on international ethics, international law, international human rights law, and so it just re <coughs> reflects um, more adequately what we do uh, with the center. So thank you for coming out on a rainy night, um, and also it's, if you know, some of you know the work that I do, and those of you who do know that I try to find connections, historical connections. Connecting the dots is a big thing for me. So I like to find dates and people to make connections. <clears throat> and I call that leveraging history. And it's uh, interesting that actually tonight uh, we have Gentle Thursday and Gentle Friday. And I was just talking to Frank <laughs> about the origin of Gentle Thursday and Gentle Friday, which I believe was probably discussed at a recent Speak Up, Speak Out. And uh, it's a kind of peaceful, there was some tensions going on <coughs> on campus in the late 60s, and it was a way for people to sort of ease their tensions. Uh, so there's one connection. And also, uh, this is the last day of Women's History Month, uh, March 31st. And uh, I'm very, very interested in the connection between the organized women's movement, which you may just know as the suffrage or right to vote movement. But however, it was much broader than that, as we will see, and it included the peace movement. And by peace movement, I mean an organized movement before World War I. Uh, a lot of people who do peace studies today typically start with the Vietnam War. Um, but in fact, before World War I, there was a highly organized peace movement, and the organized women's movement was connected to that. And so this day kind of connects both of those, uh, sort of peaceful easing of tensions and Women's History Month. So <coughs> I'm going to begin, actually, uh, most of the slides are pictures, uh, but I do have some quotes and texts, and those are on your handout, hopefully, if I hadn't made any mistakes, uh, in italics. Uh, and this is the first quote on your handout. Uh, and this is a quote from Vera Britton, which I think nicely frames uh, the conversation tonight. And <coughs> Vera Britton, this is from a wonderful book that she wrote called Testament of Youth. Uh, this is the book. It was also made into a movie. And let me just read you the quote. Uh, <coughs> and she, this is a sort of theme throughout her book. 
the influence of worldwide events and movements upon the personal destinies of men and women. So this quote connects these sort of global events with individual lives. And in Vera Britton's case, that's Vera, that happened. Um, this was basically the gang, uh, and they were all quite close. Um, this is her brother, this is her fiance, and this is their friend Victor. And they just always were together. They were very close friends, and Vera and her fiance were both headed to Oxford. Vera was one of the first women to get into Oxford. And they had plans for their lives. Um, but in fact, they all died uh, in World War I, all killed. And Vera is left in Oxford by herself, feeling kind of like, I don't know if you know the word poser, <laughs> but kind of an imposter that uh, these young men at the prime of their life go to war, lose their lives, and she's still in Oxford studying. So she couldn't do it, and um, she left, and she went to go enlist, not in the Red Cross, but something like the Red Cross, like a British Red Cross. She goes to enlist, and she tends to the war wounded, and she becomes a peace activist. And she gets involved with the League of Nations, which is the sort of international machinery that's created after World War I. Uh, but her quote, I think, helps us to understand the connection between these two amazing individuals, uh, May Wright Seawall and E.C. Warner. Um, you can see that May Wright Seawall is born in 1844. I think these dates are also on your handout. And E.C. Warner is born in 1866. So May is a couple generations older than E.C. Warner. And you will see actually that because she's older, she does some work on some things that E.C. Warner picks up on. She sort of starts to lay some foundational work that he picks up on. Uh, <coughs> both of these lives, both of these individuals, live long and public lives. And to talk about one of them is a big story. Not only because each of them was involved in a number of different causes quite passionately, but also because they were both affected by worldwide events. And those worldwide events are big stories. So you have the worldwide event being a big story, you have the individual lives being complex, so there are big stories, and I can't give you all the details, which is why <coughs> I encourage you, and those of you who are my students know this word, uh, I encourage you all to be uh, an autodidact. I usually end with this slide. I've been ending with this slide, and the last talk I gave was in Korea, which is why we have Hangul there. Um, <coughs> but autodidact comes from the Greek autos, self, and didaskalos means teacher in Greek. So an autodidact is a self-teacher. And there's no way for me to tell you everything about this. We just don't have enough time and enough years in the life, actually. So if you're interested, I encourage you to seek out some of the things that you find interesting. And on your handout, there are a number of resources. <coughs> actually, there are some Vimeo's videos. I did give a talk just on E.C. Warner and his involvement in the peace movement last year, uh, and that's available. Um, and there's also, uh, I did a talk with Professor Andy Blom, who's in the audience, on Global Ethics Day, also with Professor Maureen Eka, who is in the Department of English Language and Literature, and we talked about gender and militarism, and E.C. Warner came up in that discussion as well. So if you're interested, uh, those are some talks on Vimeo. The links are on your handout. And the other thing that I want to mention that's very interesting is there are a number of E.C. Warner's papers that have been scanned in uh, online through this project, Europeana 1914 to 1918. This is actually a World War I memory project uh, that has been convened by the European Union and Oxford University. And basically, it's just a sort of database of memorabilia from the public pertaining to World War I. If you're rusty on your history, 
Europe goes to war in World War I in 1914, and the United States enters that war in 1917. So the United States is sort of watching Europe at war for three years before engaging. And what was happening in this country at the time is very interesting. Uh, <coughs> but one of the things that was happening is E.C. Warner being involved with the peace movement. And so last year, and this is when I, we began to work, um, myself and, and the Clark, uh, <coughs> the Clark actually um, granted permission to have some of E.C. Warner's papers, which are treasures, released. And they then went to the Netherlands. They flew, not with me, they were couriered, like FedEx. And they went to the Netherlands, which is here, uh, <coughs> and they flew to uh, the Peace Palace. I'll talk about that later. This is the Peace Palace in The Hague, um, and there, this is a big story, okay? So they were flown there because Europeana was um, there for a day, and they were scanning in things. And I really wanted to get the memory of the U.S. peace movement into the European memory of World War I. That's really important to me. And I, and I also wanted to get um, a sort of small town, right? Because <coughs> Warner was here when he learned that World War I had begun. Um, and I wanted also to have something reflecting to sort of small town, middle America, and how we were reacting to World War I. And so a number of papers were hand selected and scanned in. Uh, these are some of Warner's papers that you can go look at here in the Clark Historical Library. And um, this is a librarian from the Peace Palace treating them with white gloves, as you can see. Uh, very precious. Um, <coughs> and there we are scanning them in. Um, this is just a short video. Uh, it's like two minutes long, so you can see the process. We're, you know, selecting the papers. Uh, and Warner's papers, there's, I mean, th I would say thousands of them. Okay, it's this thousands of papers, thousands of pages. Uh, and I've gone through the archives, I don't know, maybe 10 times, and there's, I'm, I'm not even, I'm maybe like 5% through them. Okay, so there's really so much there. So on your, this is the intake form where we're turning the papers over, they're gonna be scanned in. And there we are scanning them in. And, and actually those are um, two CMU students. Uh, and there they are. And so <coughs> one of those pieces uh, I will be talking about. So there's like four or five different pieces that you can look up online and the link is on there on your handout. Okay. So big stories. Um, I, I first want to start um, talking about, we talked about the dates, but one issue that when we're talking about the women's movement that um, is not talked about enough, I've mentioned it in a connection with Vera Britton, which is education for women. And we don't appreciate uh, how much work had to be done in this country to get women to be educated, to have the experience of higher education. Um, in England, it was even worse, actually. And if you're interested, um, Virginia Woolf's Three Guineas is a book that talks about the difficulty of opening up Cambridge and Oxford to women. As I mentioned, Vera Britton was one of the first. <coughs> 